Well, it's a privilege today for me to introduce to you our guest speaker. His name is Mark Clark. He comes all the way from Vancouver, Canada. Yeah, really wonderful place. And if this is your first time at Bayside, you've never heard Mark before, you are in for an absolute treat. He has a remarkable story of how he came to Christ. And then with his wife, Erin, it was nine years ago, they planted a church, it's called Village Church, and it's become so much more than a village. It's across five locations in Canada with thousands of people attending. And Mark is a remarkable guy. He's a, he's a great husband. He was here at the marriage conference talking. He He's a great dad. His three girls were at our house last night. Wonderful, wonderful children. But Mark is an astonishing thinker. He's written a book. It's called The Problem of God. And if you're going, I don't understand all of this, you should buy that book. It is a great book. But Mark is an incredible communicator. And I believe that not only for Canada, but I believe that for the globe today, that Mark has something to say. And it's not only what he has to say, it's the way that he says it, that just speaks to a new generation. It's a privilege to have him. I'm gonna ask you to do this. You don't do this every week, but you know what? He's come from Canada. Jump to your feet. Would you I give him a massive Bayside welcome? Mark Clark, everybody! <laughs> All right, all right, sit down, sit down, enough of that nonsense. All right, thank you, you guys are gracious. Uh, my wife and I are very excited to be here this weekend. We were at the marriage conference uh, yesterday to speak in a few sessions there, and pretty awesome to hang out with a bunch of you. This is kind of a second home for me. I love this church, so thank you again for having me. Um, Ephesians chapter six, it's the last couple verses, um, wrapping up the Supernatural series, and so they asked me to speak on that. And um, in these couple verses, what Paul does, it seems really simple, but I think there's a lot to unpack in it. And so uh, Ephesians chapter six, verse 21 and 22. I'm going to set the framework for the back of it and then unpack a couple of these verses for us. So it says, uh, verse 21, and he's, and he's kind of closing off the whole book of Ephesians. He's been through six chapters. He's talked about in chapter six all about the spiritual realities of the fight and the, 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 the spiritual battles that were in Supernatural. And then he says, so that you also may know how I am and what I'm doing, Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will tell you everything. So he sent him. Uh, Tychicus, I have sent him to you for this very purpose that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. And so here's the great thing about what Paul's doing. It's a great strategy to actually end the letter this way. It seems really simplistic. Hey, he's sending him his friend. He says, how, how, you know, I want you to know how I'm doing. But he's doing it very strategically. And this is what Paul does is he's, the Ephesus is kind of this church. It reminds me of Bayside. It's very loving and like, very mature and very, Paul was there for three years. It's good people. They all like each other and love each other. And kind of like this, this place where he was there. If you read Acts and the, uh, the Ephesian elders are crying when Paul leaves and he kind of, he's got this attachment to them and it's beautiful. It kind of reminds me of, of you guys versus my church, which is in Vancouver. We started nine years ago. It's full of crazy misfits and because it's the kind of church that we started in a crazy city. I don't know, have any of you been to Vancouver before? Okay, yeah, I was sharing with you guys last time I was here. It's the kind of city that literally if you, their, their worldview is a mess. It's all new age philosophy. If you, that you wear Lululemon pants and eat kale and carry a water model. That means you're connected to the universe. And I got to try to plant a church in that setting and tell them about Jesus. And so I, we started this church and it's kind of, it's more of like a Corinth scenario, right? Like that's my church. It's made up like, I don't know if you've read Corinthians, but that was a crazy church. Paul spent like, like a year and a half there and then he got it, like, got out of there. He was like, I don't like, he's like, okay, dude, have you stopped sleeping with your stepmom? And the guy's like, yeah. He's like, all right, how long's that been? Like four weeks? Okay. Elder, I got to go. All right. And he just like, <laughs> That was Corinthians, man. It was like, I'm surviving this game. I got to get you guys to figure your life out. Sweet, I'm out of here. That was, that's my church. Like the crazy people and we're just trying to figure Jesus out together and we're trying and, and we're living it. And this is what Paul's doing. How do you live in this commerce city, in this city with false idols and gods? How do you be in the world but not of it and still follow Jesus? And he's sending him and he ends it very strategically by saying, hey, I want to take to come to you and tell you two things. One is how I'm doing He's He's a great strategist in that way. Here's what Paul doesn't do. He doesn't do what we tend to do, which is misdiagnose problems and misdiagnose answers to problems. Because I do that all the time. We kind of, we, we think something's one thing, and so we make an adjustment, and it's the wrong kind of adjustment. We actually misread the scenario. Um, I did this even in my ministry. My wife uh, is no longer allowed to sit if I'm preaching and she's there, She's not allowed to sit in the room where I can see her, all right? Because 
she just, she goes like, all right, and that's not helpful, all right, to me at all, okay, so that's, so, so I have her sitting in the back, all right, where I cannot see her, because I don't need that nonsense, I'm trying to work, I don't need you criticize, I don't come, you know, come to your work, and so, <laughs> So, uh, so she's at the back where I can't see her, you know, and, and now some of you, now I started to feel bad about like, that's something's wrong with our marriage. We're not good people. Uh, maybe something, because, because who else to like, I'm thinking as a preacher, like my wife should be like right here. Like this lady, she's sitting here. She got like a notepad out and a pen, like taking notes. And uh, that's how I felt like my wife should be like, oh, this is gold. This is like every, oh, it's just coming on. Everything you're saying is perfect. And so she should be like that. And my wife's way up there with a shawl over her head, like, Meh. so I'm like, something's probably, something's probably wrong <clears throat> with our marriage. And then I went and I talked to this guy, uh, J- Dr. James Hughes, he's 96 years old. And I got to go meet with him a few months ago. He's, he's one of the founders of Regent College. And he, uh, he actually knew C.S. Lewis and Tolkien uh, as, as, as friends. And so I actually w- I went and wanted to hang out and get stories from, and he told me that and he gave me a little bit of hope. He said, actually, my wife, who died a couple of years ago, she, we used to sit and have people over. I used to talk about my books, and he wrote these big scholars. And she said, oh, stop it, James. No one reads your books. All right? And I was like, okay, I'm starting to feel better. And then he said uh, he would do consulting for churches, and he would go into churches and who would have problems and lead pastor issues or whatever. And he said, all you need me to do is put me in a room during the sermon. I just need to hear the sermon. I need to watch the wife during the sermon. Put me in an eyesight of her watching the sermon. And I'm like, oh, no, this is bad for me. And he said, because if she's sitting in the front row taking notes, something's wrong. And I'm like, okay, now we're talking, all right? And he's like, yeah, something's wrong. If she's sitting there, oh, give me, then there's probably some issues at home. See, I had misdiagnosed a problem, all right? I had thought that was a problem. It's actually a good thing that my wife sits in the back and can't look at anybody. That's actually a positive thing, right? Now, Sometimes we misdiagnose problems. Sometimes we actually misdiagnose answers to problems where we come up with an answer for it and we think, okay, that's the actual issue. Um, I went to the Apple store. My phone is broken. This is a few months ago. And I walk into the Apple store and there's this kid there. He's like 20 years old. And he, hello, and hi, this is my phone. I need a fix. He's like, so he does all the data and he's like, I can't fix, you can't fix your phone. So I'm a little mad. I've driven all the way down to, I'm like, no, come on, bro. No, I'm usually a night, but I'm like, let's go. Let's call it. Fix, fix the phone. He's, you know, he's like, no, I can't fix it. I, de- I said, fix the phone. He's like, I can't fix it. I said, okay, I'm talking to a manager. Give me, t- give me a manager. So he goes, okay. So he goes back to manager, manager. I'm like, this. Now I start getting mad. People are listening. I'm like, hey, listen, I want to do I want to fix the phone. I mean, your manager, Apple, Apple's got lots of money. You give me my phone. Da, da, da. I start freaking out a bit. The kid comes back out from the thing after five. I said, listen, you better fix my phone. He goes, I'm sorry, Pastor Mark. I'm like, what? <laughs> Come on. Sorry, you know me? He's like, yeah, I go to your church. I'm like, dude, you should have led with that, all right? Because if you led with that, this whole conversation's different, right? I'm just, hello, I have a phone to fi- Oh, you can't fix it? I'm fine. <laughs> but even then, even then, I got this issue, and I'm and I'm looking and I'm saying, he's the problem. He should have led with it. But the reality is, who was the problem? <laughs> right? I'm the problem. So this is what we do. We project. We misdiagnose. We think something's wrong with our marriage. We think something's wrong with our kids. And we give the wrong solution. Here's Paul. He, as a brilliant strategist, looks into the Ephesian problem and the problem of them living in this commerce, living in, trying to follow Jesus in the world, living in the tension. And he says, let me end. But he doesn't end with this crazy, huge, like, swell. And he doesn't end with these inspiring words. He says this. I want to tell you how I'm doing. Because that's what's going to work. I want to tell you how I'm doing what I'm doing because you love me and I'm going to inspire you by my example. That's how he ends the whole book. It's the opposite of what we would think you should do. He's diagnosed the problem so well that he wants to get in their hearts and go, let me tell you how I'm doing. Now, here's the crazy thing. Look at this. Look at this. He says, so that you may know, underline this, how I am. Think about that phrase, how I am. So he's trying to tell them, I want to look now, here's the crazy thing. Where is he when he's writing the book of Ephesians? You guys talked about this, he's in prison. So, so I'm gonna, he's, not, he's not in Napa for the weekend, all right? Let me tell you how I am. I'm in prison right now. Why would he say that to them? Because what he's saying is, you got it. things are not as they seem in your life. 
even when I'm in prison, because Jesus is the Lord, Savior, and treasure of my life, because I trust, like Revelation 1 says, that when the world is a mess, things are not as they seem, and you pull the veil back, and Jesus is there, and he's holding the seven stars, because he is the one in control, even when life looks like a disaster, even when I'm in jail, even when the circumstances of my life have squeezed me, destroyed me, my marriage is a wreck, my kids are off the rails, I got a diagnosis from the doctor, even in that scenario, I'm all right because Jesus is in charge. That's what he's trying to say. He's trying to say my theology out of chapter one, which says God is sovereign, God is ultimate, God is over all things, that even when life looks like a disaster, he's in charge, which is a beautiful thing, all right, because here's the thing, you want God in charge versus you being in charge. You, you guys are a disaster, I don't want you in charge of anything. You're narcissistic, selfish, self-involved. Every decision you make is for you. See, this is, I started my church, 50 people. And everyone's like, (laughs) everyone's like, you can't start a church like that. We're in Canada. All right. Your whole church has to be on the premise of you have ideas. I have ideas. We all have ideas and they're all fine. Sorry, that's how you should preach as a Canadian, all right? Sorry, 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 sorry. And I'm like, that's awful. So I got up and started telling people what I just said. You're wreck, you're disaster. I looked at you. You are not the hero of your own life. I don't care what Tony Robbins tells you. You are not the hero of your own life. Do not go deep inside yourself and try to find yourself. You will destroy yourself. Jesus says, deny yourself. Don't find yourself, deny yourself, pick up your cross, follow me, because you are not the hero of your own life. Jesus is the hero of your life. Jesus came, lived a perfect life in your place because you can't. He died on a cross, paid the penalty for your sin, for you, instead of you, and because of you took the wrath of God on himself, rose again. That should be an offense to all of us because you can't do what God has asked you to do. That's religion. I'm trying to be a right person. I'm trying to do this. I'm trying to go to church this many times. I I go to this priest. I do this many good things. I go on these pilgrimages. I say these prayers. That's religion. And all it's going to do is crush you. Jesus shows up and he goes, let's shut that down. There's nothing you can do that's going to make you go to heaven. So I had to come and do this for you. See, the reality is, Paul's going, I've so trusted that message, I've so trusted the sovereignty of God, that I understand that what I want, which is not to be in jail, isn't actually the best thing. That's crazy, but it's true. Listen, how many of you prayed in junior high that you would marry that girl? And you're like, Lord, please just give me that girl. Just give me, give me Colette. Lord, give me Colette. And now you see her on Facebook, And you're like, praise Jesus, thank you, Lord, (laughs) that the answer to that prayer was no. (laughs) Because things are not going well for Colette. And you're like, man, thank you, Lord. It is a good thing you aren't in charge, bro, at that moment. But the problem is we want to be in control because we think, here's what we've been told. So Paul in Ephesians 1 I don't have time to go back and read it, but he talks a lot about the will of God. And he talks about the will of God and the will of God. And we might go, well, Paul's in prison. How is he doing? He's in prison. He must not be in the will of God. The reality is, over and over and over again, we misunderstand the will of God because we think it's supposed to be for our success. We think it's supposed to be for our victory. That's man-centered theology. Jesus isn't talking about your victory. He's talking about your obedience. He wants you to be obedient. And he's not going to tell you, by the way, Everything that you want to know before you do it. That's a generational thing called entitlement. We think because we're so entitled as a generation, we think God, the way the will of God works is that if I can just, like all of these decisions to make, and I'm sure God will just show me what to do before I do it. That's how many of us function, right? And so we try to, we're like, okay, I got this. I don't know if I should marry Sarah, if I should marry Margaret. I don't know which one. Lord, please tell me. And we think he's going to go, Margaret. All right, we were waiting. (laughs) And we're like, okay, he's going to say it. I know I'm going to look at my cereal. He's going to give me a sign. Give me a sign, Lord. Give me a sign. And I'm eating my cereal. Oh, I see an M there. I see an M. I think that means Margaret. And the problem is that is not how the will of God actually functions. The re- see, listen, that comes from a culture. The reason we, one sociologist calls it the paralysis of choice. He says, 
It's a generational thing. We, see, back two generations ago, you would marry one of the 12 girls in your town that weren't your sister. Those were your options, all right? You were like, that's who you would marry. Now, you're on the internet, you're on Tinder, you don't know what to do. You're like, I don't know how to make a choice. I need God to show up and give me signs in the stars. I, I'm gonna go, some of you are trying to decide which city to move to, to go to school. And you're like, I don't know if I should go to Pittsburgh. I don't know if I should move to Seattle. I don't know if I should move to Vancouver. I don't know where I need to go to school. Lord, show me, show me, show me, right? And you're hoping, you're looking for signs. Right, as if this is some kind of magic mind where, where God is some kind of crystal ball that we can just rub and go, okay, show me, show me, show me. And some guy walks into work and you're just hoping, he's like, hello, my name is Pittsburgh. You're like, that's it, I'm moving to Pittsburgh. That's a sign. We're Christians, we're not magicians. That is not how God works. That comes from entitlement. That comes from a generation of people. Listen, my generation is a fascinating group of people. We take jobs that fit our Enneagram, all right? You know what an Enneagram is? There's like eight people in here, yeah, okay. Enneagram's like my personality pro, like, like, like if I'm gonna take a career, it has to fit the woof of my soul, all right? That's how my generation, it has to give me meaning and purpose, all right? Listen, my grandfather's 96, he worked the same job for 55, you think he took a job because it fit the woof of his soul? He had to eat. His job wasn't about giving him meaning and purpose in life. He had to eat. My generation think we're entitled. We, my, my kids, 12, 10, and eight, I love them, three girls. We were in, uh, for Christmas, we went down to a friend's house in Palm Springs and we had to fly home that day and we we're swimming in the pool, it was 80 degrees, we had to fly back to Vancouver. Now I don't know how many of you have been to Vancouver, but it rains and I hate it. And so I'm like, I'm like, I do not want to go back to Vancouver, girls. So here's the deal. Your mom's out shopping. Uh, and so, <laughs> so when she gets back, we all need to be on the same page and say, we want to, I've already looked up the airlines. We can push this like five days and we can be here. You can swim for the next five days. We can fly home on Saturday before I got to be back preaching. And my daughter, I got them lined up, man. They're like sitting on the side of the pool. I'm like, kid, this is what we're going to do. And they're, and they're just nodding. I'm like, so we all got to be, if she sniffs that you guys aren't into this plan, we are going home. And I do not want to go home. I don't. <laughs> just so please. My wife shows up, okay, eight minutes later to the pool. And she walks out. I'm like, okay, here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Because I know she's not going to be into it because it's like so much work. And I'm like, so she comes, she's the girls turned on me, all right? They look at her like, dad's trying to make us stay, but we don't want it. We want to go home. I'm like, what the crap? <laughs> like growing up, I never remember my father begging me to stay on a vacation, all right? And me going, no, father, we need to go home. We have responsibilities. I don't get it. Just entitled brats, all right? <laughs> But the reality, so this, so this is why we think of the will of God like this. We think God, you think God owes you to tell you who you're going to marry, to tell you her name, and he won't. I'll tell you what he'll do. He'll say, whoever you marry, you better serve her like Christ served the church. That's what the Bible says. It will not tell you a name, and it won't tell you a city. It'll tell you do something, and when you do it, there's a way of doing it. There's a character that you have to have. Love and respect and serve. That's what Jesus calls you to. That's the will of God for your life. To be, you know what the will of God for your life is, Romans 8 says? To be conformed to the image of his son. You know who you follow? A guy who was crucified. So you want to know the will of God for your life. It's not just happiness. It's not your victory. It's obedience in the midst of whatever circumstances you're in. The reality is, I even lapse into this karmic idea where if I'm good, then good things are come to me. You begin to think that even as a Christian. If I'm good, then God owes me something. He owes me health. He owes me wealth. He owes me a nice life. Here's Paul. Look at what he keeps saying. I want to remind you how I'm doing. Well, how are you doing? I'm in jail. This sucks. That's how I'm doing. Well, what got you there? following Jesus and being a good guy. Well, that doesn't work out. That's not karma. 
But sometimes we lapse into this, even as a pastor. My daughter has, my eight-year-old daughter has a little stuffy that she can't, how many of you have kids, they have toys that they can't fall asleep without that toy, right? Like she's got this little stuffy, it's white and pink dots. Listen, if you're young and you're just starting out having kids, let me give you a piece of advice. Don't give your kid a stuffy, all right? Don't just skip it, because you'll spend half your life looking for the stuffy, all right? I don't care what their friends are getting, just say you, get, you ain't getting one. You just go to sleep now, there's no stuffies. <laughs> because you will hate your life. And so I hated my, I was hating my life. My kid's like, I can't fall asleep, I need my stuffy. I'm like, ah. So I resorted to praying out loud for this, to God help us find the stuffy. I'm sure you're busy doing other things that matter in the universe, but the stuffy really matters for me right now because I hate my life. So please, Lord. <laughs> And, uh, and so then she goes, and then I go into another room, and we've been looking at this for this thing for like two hours, and finally we find the stuffy. And I bring it by, I look at y'all, and she's like, nah, nah, nah. she goes, and I go to my oldest daughter, 12 years old, like, I said, Sienna, isn't this amazing that God, we found the stuffy, and we, found, and we prayed for the stuffy, we found the stuffy, isn't that proof that God exists? And she goes, Dad, but what if we hadn't found the stuffy? Does that prove that God doesn't exist? And I'm like, what? Why are you challenging me right now? What is wrong with you? But that's how you begin to live your life. You begin to think that if it ain't good things, then they aren't God things. And Paul's going, let me remind you how I am. Let me remind, I, 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 I let my church know. They come to me and say, oh, Pastor Mark, your sermons. I mean, we were 50 people to start when I started telling everybody how much of a wreck their life was as Canadians and that Jesus is the hero. And so people started to show up. And because I didn't, because I didn't pretend they were all right, because I didn't say silly things that their teacher had told them, you know, growing up, like, you're really unique. <laughs> like a snowflake. <laughs> and I'm like, you're not unique at all. There's six billion of you. And people started to go, my gosh, I need to give my life to Jesus. Jesus is the hero. And people started to get saved and get baptized and off addictions and their marriages healed. Like, and people say, you know, Pastor Mark, this is great. You, you've been to this role in my life. And I remind them of something, that if you've benefited at all from my life in any form, in my ministry at all, you got to understand where I came from, that, 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 that 65 years ago, my, my dad was born in Ottawa and his sister was a few years older than him. And she was a schizophrenic and tried to kill herself multiple times. And so it forced the family to move to Toronto because they didn't have proper care in Ottawa. So they moved to Toronto. And when they moved to Toronto, the domino was that he then met my mom. And then my mom and him started dating. And then a couple of years later, they got married. And they had my brother. Four years later, they had me. And they divorced when I was eight or nine, and, which is why I got Tourette's syndrome, which is why I do my weird face twitches and body twitches up here because there was like this psychological trauma that happened when I was a kid when they got divorced. And so they got divorced and I got sent to a summer camp and I heard about Jesus, but I didn't care. And then I was in a woodworking class with a guy when I was 17, 18, he told me about Jesus and I gave my life to Jesus. And then I read the Bible by myself, just smoking packs of cigarettes, reading the Bible, hanging out with my friends, telling them about Jesus in a garage. I was hanging out, we were smoking weed in a garage one Friday and three Fridays later, I'd give my life to Jesus and I was back in the same garage defending, I was still high because the garage door was closed, but I was defending <laughs> Christianity, and I was kind of going through, and I was, and I was telling them about Jesus, and, and, and all of that, and then a guy told me this, and I was going to go and be an actor, and then he told me, you called into ministry around a campfire, and then I started crying, and then I was working on Michael's Arts and Crafts store for six eighty five an hour, and then I was putting away googly eyes, and then this person said this to me, and then I ended up going to school, and then I became a pastor, and I said, listen, if I've benefited at all from my ministry, it's because uh, 60 years ago, there was a 16-year-old schizophrenic girl in Ottawa who tried to kill herself. That's the sovereignty of God. I am glad he's in control and you're not. That's what Paul's trying to say. He's trying to say, let me tell you how I am. Let me tell you about my life. I know life is hard. I know it is difficult. I know it feels like God isn't in it. I know it feels as if he's distant. And some of you, you're like, I don't even know where to go with my faith anymore. I don't know what is next for me. I'm actually at the end of my I can't. I don't know if I, even I believe. Some of you are like, I don't know if I believe. We have tons of agnostics, atheists, Buddhists, Muslims at our church exploring Christianity, asking the worldview questions, asking origins, meaning, morality, destiny, where we came from, where we're going. 
All of that is an exploration. I get it. And then he says something here that's fascinating. He says this. Look at the other thing. He says, so that you also may know how I am. And then he says this, and what I am doing. Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful minister. This is fascinating. He uses, underline the word faithful. Uh, Here's a brother who's beloved because he's faithful, meaning what? Meaning he's gonna get to the end. Meaning he has been faithful, meaning the things that God has called you to, whether it's in your marriage, let's think about your marriage, right? What does what God call you to in your marriage? It's to be faithful. It's, it, it's to get, listen, the thing about marriage is, is it, 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 what's important about it isn't the first day. We pour all this time and money and energy into the first day. We spend tens of thousands of dollars to invite all our friends. We all get dressed up. We all come together to a wedding. And I was telling the marriage conference, I don't like, like doing weddings for me is like, I'm just sick of them. Like I'm sick of just sitting there looking at these young people that are 21. Oh, I love you. And you were like, yeah, you've known each other for nine months. Of course you love her right now. And they're doing these vows. Oh, you're so sparkly. And, and, and they start doing poems to each other. Like, hi, Tracy. I wrote you a poem. T, trustworthy. And it's like, ah! <laughs> because why are you... T- any fool can get married. What matters about marriage ain't the first day, it's the last day. How did you go toward the last day? That's what faithfulness is. Any one of you can come to know Jesus. Any one of you can, some of you grew up in the church, you went to summer camp as a kid, you can't even remember a time when you, you were birthed in the pew. You were just in a church, you're like, that's where I was. I can't remember time without Jesus in my life. I get it. You've been religious your whole life. You've known church your whole life. And the problem is the gospel comes along and says, but it's not about what you've done. It's about what he He's done, and you can be born in the church, serve in the church, die and have a wedding in the church, die in the church, have your funeral in the church, and still wake up in hell. Why? Because you didn't know him. You knew stuff, you knew, you knew externals, you knew about him, but knowing about him and knowing him are vastly different things. So how do you be faithful? How do you get to the end? How do you persevere? How do you have the legacy where on your last day, you still love and serve Jesus? On your last day, not your first day. That's what faithfulness is. And the Bible constantly talks about it. And it says, the thing about faithfulness is you gotta be faithful to who you are. You gotta be faithful to what God has called you to do and you to be and not compare yourself to other people. Because the minute you start comparing yourself to other people, things get derailed very quickly. The minute I sit in marriage counseling all the time and these people are fighting and hate each other based on comparison. Comparison is toxic. Never compare yourself to anybody. God has crafted you to do what you do, not what other people do. And don't compare in your marriages. I'll tell you what'll destroy your marriage is Instagram. You'll be scrolling through Instagram and wives will look at that husband who took their wife down to uh, Hawaii for the sixth time this year and she'll look at her husband and go deadbeat. (laughs) Where's my Hawaii trip? All right, he's making more money than you. He's been more successful than you. He takes his wife to Hawaii. What have you done lately? It'll kill your marriage, man. It will destroy you. And husbands scrolling, seeing that woman looking like that. And why can't you look like that going on in the back of his brain? Right? Why don't you look like that anymore? It's because because you did this to me, fool. Right? We've been married 20 years. What are you talking about? That's why you wanted kids, remember? What's wrong with you, bro? Do not compare. We'll destroy you. And when I had to understand that, that's the only way to get to the end. You gotta be you. When I, I, when I showed up in, uh, at, at, at the church in Vancouver, what I wanted to do with my life was become a professor. I was gonna go to Oxford and uh, do a PhD in New Testament and uh, my stop along the way was Vancouver. I was gonna do two years, do a master's degree there and then I was gonna go to Oxford and become a professor and a writer because footnotes are way better than people. I don't know if you got this vibe. I'm not like, a, I'm not necessarily like people that much. So being a pastor is a weird job. Because I, so it's, so, but footnotes, footnotes don't cheat on their wives. They don't send stupid emails into the thing about the sermon. They do nothing. They're just there, right? So it's way easier. So I was like, I'm just going to sit in a library for eight hours a day and read footnotes and write and become a scholar. That's what I want to do. And Vancouver's a stop, a rainy, dark stop on the way to where I want to go, which is trade that rain for British rain (laughs) in Oxford. And so that's what I wanted to do. 
But in the meantime, I started working at this church and this church, they said, hey, we want you to get up and preach, but you got to preach like our pastor preaches. And I'm like, well, what's that? And they're like, well, we do these notes every week in the bulletin and they all have lines on them and, they're, and you have to fill in the blanks and they all start with the same letter and he always opens with a joke. And so I was like, okay, I guess I'll do that. So they was like, I got up and I'm like, okay, so two Jews walk into a bar. I'm like, no, <laughs> no good. Okay. So then I'm like, all right, let's start working through your notes here. And then I'm like, you know, fa- F. Let's all start with F. Family, friends, faith, food. I'm running out of F words. I don't even know. And, they, and I just got down. It was totally terrible. It was awful. They were like, what was that? I'm like, I don't know. I was trying to fill in the blanks. Things were trying to rhyme. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and so they said, okay, look, if you're going to do this again, you just got to be you. And I'm like, okay, cool. So they said, what's you? I'm like, just get up and yell at everybody for an hour. That's, that's me. <laughs> just, just scream at everybody about how they have to repent and they're all a disaster. And they're like, really? I don't know how that's going to go over. I'm like, well, let's just give it a shot. So, you know, all these people have their pens out. They're ready. I'm like, put your pens away. <laughs> Sit down. You know, um, and by the end of it, all these people come to Christ. It was like. God hates you, figure it out. <laughs> no. And everyone's like, <laughs> I can't give my life to, they're coming to the front. <laughs> and, uh, and I walked off the stage and uh, this guy walked up to me and he said, what do you want to do with your life? And I said, I want to I wanna be a scholar, I want to do this. And he said, don't. He said, do this. Do this. This is what you're made for. But I was trying to be somebody else. You, you want to be faithful to what Jesus has called you to do. You got to be faithful in a way. He's called you. You are crafted with gifting and a past and a history. But you got to, you got to, you got to reach people digging deep into the, the, the weakness, the, 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 the limp that you've got. That's how people see it is the authenticity of who you are. My, my, my pastoring job, I think I shared this with you a time or two ago when I was here, that my pastoring job with Tourette's never really should have worked because I randomly would just swear at people, like to myself, I just rah, rah, swear. It's a weird job to be a preacher when you just randomly swear at people because people get confused, right? And they don't understand. Like, there's nothing about it that should have worked. It shouldn't have worked, and it shouldn't. But God said, I want you to get to the end and the only way you're going to get to the end is to be faithful to what I've called you to. That's why Paul says, look, I want you to know how I'm doing. I want you to know what I'm doing. And I want to hold faithfulness up to you as the paradigmatic issue of your salvation. Will you get to the end? And then he says this, here's how you get to the end. He ends it like this. It's the last word. I have sent him to you for this very purpose that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your what? Hearts, your cardia, your affections, not what you do, what you want to do. You want to know how you know that you actually, listen, Jesus can't just be your, your Lord and your savior. He's got to be your treasure. You have to cherish him above everything else in the universe. That's how you know. See, Jonathan Edwards uh, would preach and tens of thousands of people would come to know Jesus. And he'd say, it makes me nervous because I don't know whether they're actually having true conversion or not. I think these people are coming forward, saying prayers, doing these mantras, but their actual affections haven't changed. They don't soar for him. They don't delight in him. Their entire relationship to God is out of duty. And what he wants is he doesn't want duty. He doesn't want externals. He doesn't want to do just what you're doing. He wants to get after what you want to do. What do you delight in? What do you cherish? What do you actually, from your affections level, from your heart, that's what he's after. That's why he says, I want your hearts to soar for him. Not just your, your behavior, but your actual life, your, your, your mind, your everything inside of you. This is what Jesus is after. This is why Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, he would constantly say what? He would say this, and I know that you heard that it said, don't murder people in the Old Testament, but that's not good enough. I say, if you hate your brother, you've already murdered him, what? In your what? In your heart. He says, you can't lust after a woman. I know you heard it said you can't commit adultery. I'm going to make it harder. You thought it was going to be easier in the New Testament. You thought the Old Testament was tough and the New Testament's all about grace. and No, 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 no. I'm going to make it harder. If you lust after a person, 
who's not your spouse, you've already committed adultery with them in your heart. That's, that's tough for guys and girls. Right, we, we were uh, on our way back, uh, stopping over for a mission trip that we were in in, uh, in Uganda, and we stopped in Dubai for a few days, and we took the kids to like this like traditional Middle Eastern dinner, and we're sitting at the dinner, and as part of the dinner, they had this guy come out, and he was a fire, like he would do fire, and he would dance around, and he went out, came out with no shirt, and the dude was like cut from a rock, all right, he had this... 12 pack and he was like his body was all tanned up like an Egyptian he like comes out and he's got the fire he's like and I noticed something all right I noticed that my wife had been very chatty that whole time (laughs) talking to her girlfriend over here all right all of a sudden I wasn't hearing any chatting anymore and I looked over and this girl was lasered in right here all right and I'm like, what's going on? She's like, it's like, oh, all right. And at one point, it was really awkward because there was 400 people, and, there was, and all of a sudden, she's like, woo! <laughs> and I'm like, you shall not lust after a person who's not your spouse. That's adultery, baby. And she's like, uh, what? All right. That girl was distracted, man. All right, it's hard. Jesus doesn't want your behavior. Your behavior is derivative of your gut getting changed. You know, we don't change top down. We change from the gut. The gut is more powerful than your reason. How many people have I sat with in marriage counseling, young guys, and they look at me and they say, I say, look, this girl that you're dating, it's not going to work out. Like, you don't connect at all. And he's like, yeah, but she's hot. (laughs) And I'm like, yeah, it's not going to work out, bro. Yeah, I know, I know, I know, but she's hot. And then it's like, okay. He's not thinking with his logic because his gut is more powerful. That's what happens to all of us. Jesus desires your actually gut gets changed. Your heart, what you want to do. So let me pray to that end. Father... I pray that these words would actually wash over us that Paul ends his letter with. That he wants to actually encourage our hearts, hold himself up as an example of when life ain't perfect, which it's not in any of our scenarios in this room. (laughs) That we would actually trust in the sovereignty of God and that would give us steel in our spine. It would help us to understand that even in the tragedies and the difficulties the pinnacle of which is the cross, that we would understand that it is then that you are moving and shaping our lives because your desire is for your glory to be felt in the world, not ours. And that that would ultimately be for our good, even if it's in the crucible. And that you never promise anyone in this room that we won't drown. Your promise is that we are safe and drowning. And Paul sitting in prison wants to give that message. That if you've trusted Jesus, you are safe to drown. Safe to suffer. Safe to go through trial in the end. So be faithful from your heart. In Jesus' good name we pray. Amen.